I'm not trying to sing a song. I actually did one this morning. It wasn't too bad. But I'm going to try this one. I, I don't know how I'm going to do on this because I can't even remember the key it's in off the top of my head. But we'll see. I think you'll enjoy it if I can do it. It says, He is risen. Amen. I probably would have gotten a lot more excited about it preaching it, but 
I think we did fair to Midland anyway. But tonight I'm excited. This is actually a message that I had originally thought I would deliver last week that I didn't get to. So uh, tonight we're going to go ahead and deliver this message. If you have your Bibles and you'd open them, please, to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Beginning at verse 21, we're going to read through verse 27. If we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, the King James text reads, But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is on the table, and truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there also was a strife among them which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you, as he that serveth. I know that may sound like a little bit confusing a text, but I think we're going to make some sense out of it tonight. I want to talk to us tonight about being a team player. Being a team player. Master, we thank you, God, for your word. We're asking tonight, God, again, for your precious anointing, God. I know sometimes people hear this word and they think we just use it arbitrarily, but Lord, you and I know tonight how important that precious flow of Holy Ghost oil is to help your minister deliver the Word of God that you've placed in their spirit. God, there's not a thing in this world I could ever say that could help anybody outside of your anointing, that precious presence that rides upon the words which are spoken, the things that are preached, and allows the hearer to know that this is coming from God, this is the Word of God. Lord, oh Lord, anoint my lips of clay, anoint the ears of the hearer, that we might receive, God, tonight from your word that which you would have us to receive. For we ask it in the lovely, wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated tonight. And amen. Being a team player, the Lord has announced that his betrayer is about to perform his evil deed. In the final moments before he is to be tried, crucified, and buried, the Lord shares some of his most passionate words with his closest friends and followers, his disciples, or as they would later come to be known, his apostles. Look at the words the Lord chooses to share at this dark and dismal, dire hour. He instructs his men as to just how exactly they are and are not to serve as ministers of the gospel. You know, when somebody's facing death, they usually talk about what's most important to them at that moment in time. And what was important to the Lord was that ministers and the ministry understand its place. Amen. That was important to the Lord. Here he was knowing that Judas was about to betray him, and yet all he could think about is, gentlemen, I want to explain to you how it works in the kingdom of God. I want to explain to you how ministry works. I want you to understand while y'all are arguing about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Hey, Lord, here's a perfect opportunity for you to announce that Peter's the first pope. Hello? Here's the perfect opportunity for the Lord to have said the greatest among you is Peter. But he didn't do that, did he? 
I will point something else out to you real quick while I'm on that vein. If you remember this morning's message, and I talked about how the Lord went into Jairus' house, and he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, and you'll remember that the Bible said he took Peter, James, and John with him into the room of the little girl, as well as the girl's parents, right? Isn't it funny that Jesus never did anything with Peter alone? Ha ha! See, you can't even point to Peter and say, well, Peter was the one that had the closest relationship with the Lord. No. It didn't happen. He never took Peter alone. Whenever the Lord took a smaller group than the twelve, He always took those three. Peter, James, and John. You remember the transfiguration? Who was there to witness it? Peter, James, and John. Who's one opened his big mouth and said, Lord, let's build three altars, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, Peter. <laughs> Peter always had a way opening his mouth and inserting his foot. Thank God he was the first Roman Catholic Pope. The one who misspoke the most is the one that they practically deify. And I'm not even saying, and you know my position on this, I'm not saying that God did not promise Peter that he would indeed hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven and that he would open the door. And I've talked about the fact, the Lord said in Acts 1 and 8, that ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And it was Peter who literally opened the door of the full gospel of Jesus Christ to each of those segments of society in that day. First he opened the door in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, then he opened the door to the Samaritans, he opened the door to the Gentiles. Yes, it was Peter who opened the door. But honey, once the door was open, it was open. Amen. Peter, Peter still doesn't have to hold the keys because the door's done open. I don't know about you, but once I get in my house, I put the keys back in my pocket. Amen. You don't need it anymore again. So the Lord, at, the, at one of the most stressful times in his entire life, the Lord chooses to answer these gentlemen who are discussing and arguing amongst themselves who would be the greatest. He decides to instruct them on how the work of the ministry and how the kingdom of God is structured. And as usual, his words almost seem to contradict the very nature of we human beings. You know, a lot of times when the Lord talks, the things he says, just it's almost like the complete antithesis. It's the complete opposite of what we as human beings want to do, like to do. Because after all, the more people we have under us, the greater the temptation becomes to set ourselves up as someone special or someone who sits higher than the rest. But this, the Lord said, is not to be the case in the church of Jesus Christ. If there is ever any evidence that the Roman Catholic institution is completely contrary to everything that God has ever designed for his church, Surely this text brings out this truth. There are no popes or priests in God's kingdom. None have special powers that the others do not have. According to Roman doctrine, the priest has been given literally special powers by God so that when he lifts up that little chalice of wine, and when he holds it in the mass, when he holds it up like this, according to Roman teaching, that becomes the literal blood of Christ. And only the priest who has been properly ordained can do that. Nobody else. It's a special gift that God gives to priests. That's a lie. There are no priests. There are no popes in God's kingdom. No one sits up higher than another. Nobody has a power that somebody else doesn't have. Now, there may be differences of gifts 
as the Bible tells us, but nobody has a special quote-unquote power. I want to tell you today, none are greater in holiness or godliness than the next. Despite differences in levels of spiritual maturity and behavioral patterns, there still are none that are more holy or more godly than the next. You can only be as holy as you can be where you're at. That's like saying an adult is smarter than a child. No, the adult is not smarter than the child. The child may be every bit as smart as the adult, but they don't have the experience. They haven't been exposed to as much as the adult has. So it has nothing to do with intellect. It has to do with experience. There are a lot of believers in the church. They may not be living what you think is holy. They may not be living what you count as righteous. They may not be living it the way you think they ought to be living it. But honey, they're living it to the best of their ability where they're at because they're still bathed in Christ. And just because you can gnaw on a steak and enjoy the meat of the gospel and they're still weaning off of the milk doesn't mean that they're less holy in God's eyes than you are. You hear what I'm saying now? Amen. That's important to understand that, children. You've got to understand that. A lot of churches, you know, they're so busy trying to make everybody fit into the same mold and make everybody do the same things and act the same way. And they're cramming babies behind the wheel of automobiles. Honey, you can't make, I don't care how hard you try, you can't make a two-year-old drive a car. They're not built for it yet. They're not big enough yet. Their little feet can't touch the gas pedal and they can't see over the top of the steering wheel. They don't have the ability. But you go into a lot of religious organizations and boy, two minutes after you come in, they want to, you know, teach you how to pile your hair on top of your head and they want to show you how long your dress ought to be. Or they want to make sure that you're not celebrating Christmas. Or they want to make sure that you're not having a birthday party for your child. Because everybody has to fit right into that mold as fast as we can get them there. Instead of giving people space and room to grow. I've told you before, I had a lady in my first church thought she needed to talk to one of my members because she hadn't conformed to a lot of the standards that I was preaching and teaching at that time. And I told that lady, shut your mouth. If anybody needs to talk to June, I'll talk to June. That would be my job. And I've got news for you. From where I'm sitting, June is growing. June is developing. June's doing wonderful. And if you open your mouth and say one word to her, you'll discourage her right out of the church. So keep your mouth shut. You can't expect a two-year-old to drive a car. Am I telling the truth tonight? Amen. I want to tell you tonight... This idea of His Holiness the Pope, what a crock of crap that is. His Holiness my behind. I don't care how much the man runs around in his white outfits looking pure and righteous and godly. I don't care how sweet and kind he appears when he's patting people on the head and kissing babies on the cheek. Nobody in God's kingdom is set up above another. Nobody in God's kingdom is more holy or more righteous than another. And that's something we need to understand tonight. Because these were the concepts that the Lord spoke about on His last day on earth before His death. This is what was on His mind. Now listen to me today. What distinguishes the great man or woman of God in God's sight is their willingness to step down, not up. How do you like that? Oh, Pope Benedict's the most wonderful thing ever hit planet Earth, bless God. Why, it's just so wonderful that he's willing to 
take on the position of Pope. Yeah, bless God, I'll tell you, it would just kill me if I had to become king of the world and live in a palace and be waited on hand and foot and never have to cook a meal for myself the rest of my entire life. It would just destroy me. But you know what? That doesn't impress God when you're willing to step up. But what impresses God is when you're willing to step down. Amen. To do the menial is more important to the Lord than doing the majestic. Doing the menial task in Jesus' name is more important than doing the greatest task in Jesus' name. I want you to know tonight, according to Luke chapter 14, 7 through 14, I'm sorry, 7 through 11, the Word of God reads, And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him, and he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. And when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them, or adoration, admiration, in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Roman pontiff tonight lives as a king. He sits in thrones. He's driven chauffeured everywhere he goes. And he served meals prepared for him by professionals. He lives in a palace. He attends functions and sits at tables that are attended and occupied by kings, queens, princes, prime ministers, presidents, and so on. This is not the life of a Christian leader. In fact, this contradicts every single principle and teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. The truest measure of a Christian leader's salt is his willingness to do for those whom he serves. I'm not talking about doing the nice things, performing weddings or baby dedications. No, no. I'm talking about getting down on the floor beside a church member in their home who's screaming and pulling at her hair on the verge of a nervous breakdown and letting her know that everything's going to be all right. When I put that in my notes for this message, that comes from experience. I had a lady in my first church, bless her heart. To this day, remembering it breaks my heart. Connie was going through a lot. I didn't know everything she was going through until later, after this experience. But one day, her son called me. He said, Brother Marl, can you please come? He said, my mother, he said, I think she's having a nervous breakdown. And I rushed down to their house. I love having church members. I love having people in the church. I love to be able to do things for God's people. That's what God called me to do, and I enjoy it. That's my life. It's not about being a pope and walking around with the worship and admiration of the world. No, I could care less if any of that ever happens. I like doing the little things. I like doing the dirty things. I like getting down in the mud with God's people when they're going through a battle and a trial and helping them find their way out. That's what I like. And I ran down to their house as fast as I could. It took about 20 minutes or so. And I got to the house, and, and Johnny opens the door. Frankie, I'm sorry. Frankie opens the door. And I go in, and Connie is in the corner of her dining room, literally, just pulling her hair. And she's screaming at the top of her lungs. And I got down next to her on that floor. And I took her in my arms, and I held her close to me, and I let her scream. 
And I said, Connie, it's going to be okay, honey. It's going to be okay. God's here for you, sweetheart. Don't you sweat it. It's going to be okay. And then I started to pray, and her children were there, and her husband was there. And they began to pray with me, and we began to pray. And the Holy Ghost come down, and God put a peace on her, and she was able to come out of that nervous breakdown that she was having. And she said, oh, Brother Ma, I'm so embarrassed, I'm so humiliated. I said, why? Because you think your pastor's going to look at you any different tomorrow than he did yesterday? Because of what I saw today? I said, honey, get that out of your mind. Tell that devil to go home. I said, I got news for you. I knew you were human the day before yesterday. I know you're human today, and I'll know you're human tomorrow. Right. So what I'm seeing today is just a manifestation of your humanity. There's times we break down. There's times we can't take it. There's times we lose it. It happens to me, and I admit it. Most preachers won't admit it, but I admit it. I'll say it. I do it. So why am I going to look down on her when I know that I myself have times when the pressure gets me? And I say things I shouldn't say, do things I shouldn't do. But you see, that's ministry. Tommy, that's what God called me to do, and I love every minute of it. It tickles me to be able to go into a home where a lady is on the verge. That lady would have wound up in a mental hospital. She would have wound up in a mental hospital. And instead, we were able to come and get beside her and show her love and show her support and pray her through till the Holy Ghost, the presence of God, came on the scene and rescued her and picked her up from that hideous mindset that she was in. That's, that's ministry. I've been in situations where I had to clean up feces from elderly individuals. I've gone to their home to visit. It was a Catholic couple in West Haven when I was doing my internship at West Haven, Connecticut. Roman Catholic couple in their 70s. The man was wheelchair ridden. I'd go over there to visit them sometimes just to be a testimony. I was friends with their granddaughter, Debbie, and I'd go to visit with the, the grandparents sometimes. And we got along wonderful. They were sweet people. Sometimes the old fellow would have made a mess. And I'd say to the mother, let me help you. Oh, Brother Ma, no, I couldn't have you. <laughs> I couldn't have you help me with this. And I said, oh, yes, you can. Don't you dare take my blessing. Don't you dare try to steal my blessing. You let me do this. This is ministry. This is what I was called to do. You let me do this. I've had to pick folks up from the floor who had fallen off their beds trying to go to the restroom and defecated all over themselves and all over the bed, smeared it everywhere, and have to pick them up and set them aside for a moment and then help the wife clean up everything and then get them cleaned up so we could get them back in bed. That's ministry. That's ministry. When I see a single pulp do any one of the things I'm talking about, then, then I'll know they're even remotely close to God. So then I've been in situations where I had to pick elderly folks up and place them on a porta potty because they could not walk from their bed to the bathroom. And they've been so humiliated and embarrassed that you know what? When you love the Lord, you live to serve. And when God's called you to ministry, you know that ministry is not in the pulpit. That's not but one tiny aspect of ministry. You know one of the reasons that I am so disappointed after 13 years of ministering as I have been for the last 13 years. One of the reasons I'm so disappointed we don't have a church full of people is because 
I have no opportunities to do what I'm called to do. I'm not called upon to do the things that I would love to be able to do. Preaching's great, it's grand, it's wonderful, but honey, when Emily was with us, I at least got to go visit Granddad when he was in the hospital. And I like that. I got to go visit him once he got home from the hospital, and I like that. I got to attend his funeral, and Tommy was with me, and Tommy will tell you that I sat, we sat at the back of the church. I didn't try to sit up front. I didn't try to make somebody out of myself. I didn't try to look like I was somebody special. I didn't try to make an issue of the fact that I was Emily's pastor. I was there for Emily. If anybody else knew it or not, that didn't matter. <laughs> And a lot of preachers, boy, they'd have marched straight up to the front of the church, sat down on that front pew, and made a big hoop to do that they're a, a preacher as well. I go into black churches. I'm very familiar with how black churches operate as far as protocol. A minister comes in, they want to know that you're a minister because they're going to invite you to come sit on the platform with the pastor. The tradition, they've done it for many, many years. We used to do it in our churches, too. Nowadays, they don't hardly do it anymore in the white church, but in the black churches, it's done. When I go into a black church, you know what I do? I sit on the back pew. I wait for them to ask me. If they don't ask me, then they don't know. And when they invite me to come up higher, then I go sit up on the platform. And I don't march in there with the arrogance of a preacher. I'm a preacher, bless God. Somebody going to lead me up to the platform? I've seen it. You think I'm joking. I've seen it. See, I'm trying to tell you, God is not impressed with people who know how to, who are willing to step up. God's impressed with people who are willing to step down. I want you to know tonight, I'm... As I've said, I'm not talking about doing the nice things, performing weddings and things of that nature. I'm talking about getting down in the dirt. I'm talking about getting down in the mud, doing what needs to be done at the hour, at the moment. I'm talking about uh, helping, you know, uh, folks to clean up messes, and it's humiliating to them that you would even have to be there to help them, but... That's ministry. That's what ministry is all about. I got news for you. Anybody that's in ministry would know better than to wear white. I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you think about it for a second. Anybody that's in ministry would know better than to wear white. Because if you can wear white and stay white for very long, you're not much of a minister. Amen. You're not much of a minister. <laughs> I get a kick out of Benny Hinn. You know, he loves to run around looking like the Lone Ranger in his white outfits, you know. But I'll tell you what, any kind of minister I've ever known, especially if you have that many people, you sure are going to get dirty fast if you're wearing white. Because at some point, you're going to have to get down on your knees. At some point, you're going to have to get down in the dirt. At some point, you're going to have to get down on your rear end and sit down on the floor with that poor saint. I told you the story about Sean King getting the Holy Ghost in the first service I ever preached at Riverside and how the little boy come down, nine years old, about this high. And I said, honey, what do you want the Lord to do? He said, Chuck, I want the Lord to give me the Holy Ghost. And the first thing I did was get down to his level, down on my... Can you imagine if I was wearing white? Well, I'd have got up, my knees have been all dirty. I'd have looked like a real mess. But you see, that's ministry. That's how you minister to people. Part of the ministry is you get down to where they are. My Uncle Philip, bless his heart, used to come to my first church, and he loved it. He did. He loved it. He really did. Philip said to me one time, he said, Chuck, there's one... One reason, he said, I know you're my nephew, he said, but I'm going to tell you one reason I love to come to your church. He said, you don't expect me to be anybody but me. 
He said, most preachers I get around, he said, they constantly, they give you that little cross-eyed look if you happen to cuss, or they look at you funny if you say things a certain way. Or, you know, you always feel like they're criticizing. You always feel like they're judging. You always feel like they're trying to find fault in you. He said, but here you are, my nephew. He said, but I, I don't care who you're with. You never expect anybody to be anybody but themselves. And I said, Philip, that's ministry. Jesus never expected anybody to be anybody but themselves. When he met the woman at the well, he sat on the side of the well alongside of that woman and began to talk to her, and he did not expect her to be anybody but who she was. And when he asked her a question, he appreciated an honest answer. And we talked earlier today about people who they don't want to hear what people have to say about themselves. No, I know why people are gay. I know why people are this way. I know why people are that way. No, you don't. You never shut your mouth long enough to listen. And Jesus listens. Because ministry, that's what ministry is about. It's about getting down to your level. I've got news for you. If you're trying to pick somebody up, you're not going to pick them up from way up here. Not without breaking your back. If you're going to pick them up, you better get down where they are and start from there. Hello now. Amen. I can't help anybody up to a better place than God unless I'm willing to meet them where they're at. That's ministry. But you get dirty. You get dirty in ministry. You know, your knees get dirty. Your clothes get dirty. Because you're not always in the cleanest, most wonderful, lovely situation. Sometimes things get a little messy. But that's okay, Tommy. That's ministry. Amen. Now listen to me. Christianity, I say, isn't about staying clean. In fact, it's about getting dirty. We always talk about, you know, it's all about staying pure, staying clean. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. It's about keeping your inside pure. But, honey, if your outside ain't getting dirty, then you're not much of a saint. Preacher, if your outside ain't dirty, then you're not much of a preacher. You're not much of a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks who do nothing remain clean. Popes who walk around in white all day, every day of their papacy are doing nothing because they stay clean. Those who do everything are always dirty. When a man can walk about day after day in robes of white in an effort to appear holy before the world, it's obvious that this, that this man knows nothing of serving the Lord. For it's in doing for one another the Lord said that we do for him. Amen. Matthew 25, 31 through 46 reads, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. In whose glory? In his glory. When who shall come? The Son of Man. Not the Son of God, the Son of Man. When you see a human form returning in whose glory? In his glory. What did God say? My glory will I not give unto another. And all the holy angels with him. Not some of them, all of them. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Hallelujah. When all this is said and done, he said, then the Son of Man is going to sit in the throne of his glory. But read the book of Revelation. There's only one throne. Hallelujah. And it's called the throne of God and of the Lamb. And the Bible says, and there's one that sat on that throne. Whew. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, 
Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. A quick point here. This fire is eternal. If it's going to burn you up and you're going to be finished in two minutes, you're going to be toast and you'll no longer be in fire, then honey, there's no need for the fire to last forever. Amen. When I bake a cake, after 30 minutes, I turn the stove off because the cake is baked. When you cremate a body, you put it in the crematorium for 20 minutes, you burn it up. When it's all done, you turn it off, you scrape out the ashes, and you put it in an urn. It's done. Nobody's going to be annihilated. There are everlasting fire. The Lord said, everlasting fire. But listen, it was never prepared for people. It was never meant for people. Jesus died. We, we, we looked at it last week. For all. Once and for all. Nobody was supposed to go into the fire but the devil. But there are those who in this life have chosen to worship and serve that devil. And the Lord says, well, it's only fair. You want to serve him? Fine, then spend eternity with him. You want to serve me? Then you'll spend eternity with me. But listen, he says, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not, to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Amen. 